Here in Cairo, cures and treatments for everyday ills have been handed down since ancient times. This family-run pharmacy relies on a whole range of natural ingredients for many of its cures. Pharmacology took root in Islam during the 9th century when it became independent from medicine. And even in the early days, pharmacists were licensed professionals threatened with humiliating corporal punishments if they adulterated drugs. Islamic pharmacists became experts in preparing and extracting herbs for medicinal purposes. This, um, this particular herb is um, it's, it's from a plant, but it looks like a scorpion. So that's, that's the name that they've given it. You've got high cholesterol. This is the one that you need to use. This herb um, is grown just on the borders of Egypt, just bordering with Libya. And um, apparently it's, it's, um, it's for diabetes. It helps people who, um, who are diabetics. These seahorses are apparently used as good luck charms. And also, people have them for, like, vitamins. This is the Oh. My herb man over here has just said that it's very good if you're just about to get a cold or you feel run down. It gives you lots of energy, gives you a bit of a buzz. Shukran. eminent of all scientists was Ibn Sina. He was by all accounts a precocious youth. At the age of 10 he knew the entire Quran by heart and by the time he was 16 he was studying and practicing medicine. He wasn't the only famous medical practitioner. Al Zahrawi was held by many to be the greatest Muslim surgeon of the Middle Ages. He invented lots of surgical instruments many of which are still used with modifications today. He promoted the use of antiseptics on wounds and described how to remove cataracts, an Arabic innovation. Another great name in medieval medicine was Al-Razi, who worked in Baghdad in the 9th century. Legend has it that he hung lumps of meat all around the city. And he went and inspected them, and where the meat rotted most slowly, that's where he cited his hospital. In fact, the very idea of a hospital comes from that time. He aimed to provide all sorts of facilities, from treatment and convalescence to asylum and a retirement home. And actually, the hospitals then were very much precursors of the NHS, because treatment was available for rich and poor, and as a Muslim, you're on a bound to care for the sick. But Al Razi's greatest leap forward was in basic hygiene. <laughs> Islam places a high value on cleanliness, and the ritual of washing your hands and feet before you go into a mosque is strictly observed. That's why there are so many fountains outside them. But cleanliness in general was also expected. In the year 993, there were 1,500 public baths, like this one, in the city of Baghdad. Besides washing and socialising, Bathing was also about spiritual purification. But it's difficult to keep properly clean without soap. The classical world lacked effective detergents and used anything from olive oil to pumice stones to keep clean. But in the 9th century, Arazi mentions that hard soap was already in wide use in bathhouses like this. In Europe, at the same time, soap was unheard of, and people either stayed dirty or washed in water. It wasn't until the 18th century that Europeans cleaned up their act. A recently discovered manuscript from the 13th century actually details the recipe for making soap, but that's all they knew. How and why it worked would remain a mystery for centuries.
That ancient recipe suggests you make soap by taking dark sesame oil and heating it up with potash and alkali, that's another Arabic word, and lime. But actually, it doesn't need to be as complicated as that. Let me show you. What you need is some oil, and this is ordinary cooking oil. And I'll slosh a bit of that in there. And some caustic soda. Here we are, sodium hydroxide. And we'll bung that lot in there. Don't get it on your hands. And we stir that up a bit. And then I'll put it on the fire here. And you need to heat this up, preferably without boiling it, for an hour or two. And after a bit, it goes sort of gloopy like this one, a bit like porridge. And when you reckon it's about as thick as it's going to get, you take it out and let it cool. And what you wind up with is hard soap. You have to put it in a dish to cool, preferably non-stick. And this is what you wind up with. Look at this lovely hard soap. And what they discovered was that to get hard soap, you don't use potash, potassium hydroxide, you use sodium hydroxide, caustic soda. Look at that. And you add a little pinch of salt, and that gives you lovely hard soap. Let me explain to you how it works. Oil comes in long ribbon-like molecules, like that. This might be oil or grease. They're actually hydrocarbon chains, these, and they don't dissolve in water. They're hydrophobic. They don't like water. Soap, a soap molecule, this is magnified a million, million, million times or something like that, has tails that look like oil molecules, long, thin hydrocarbon tails that are hydrophobic. But it also has a hydrophilic end. This is like water. This enjoys water and will dissolve in water. So it's a combination of the two. When you get dirt on your skin, it's always mixed with the natural grease and oil that's on your skin, and all the dirt sticks with the grease, and if you put that in water, it doesn't come off because the grease won't dissolve in the water. But if you use a soap molecule, the, the hydrophobic ends mix with the grease, because it's the same sort of stuff, and pick up the dirt. And when you go into the water, then the hydrophilic end dissolves in the water, comes away, and pulls the tails with it, pulls the grease off your hand, and takes the dirt along with it. All over the Islamic world, chemists were in great demand. Their discoveries had brought innovations and great wealth. Apart from oils, perfumes and medicines, there was one sinister development in the 9th century that would profoundly change the world. 